Good evening, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to our service at Bethany Assembly of God, our Wednesday night service. I'm Pastor Dabney, and I want to share the word of the Lord with you tonight. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, once again, we thank and praise you for the privilege of assembling ourselves together to lift our voices, to give praise and glory to you. As I stand before you tonight, I acknowledge that in myself, I am nothing. Without you, I can do nothing. So, Father, I'm asking that for the next few minutes of time, that you would grant unto me, your servant, the ability to speak the word that you have put upon my heart. May the Holy Spirit go before me tonight, preparing every one of our hearts that we would receive with understanding what the Spirit is saying to the church in this hour. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would turn with me in your Bibles tonight to Genesis chapter 18, I want to read verses 1 through 5, and then verse 22 and 23. And the Lord appeared unto him, that is, unto Abraham, in the plains of Mamre. And he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lift up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door, and bowed himself toward the ground, and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. After that you shall pass on, for therefore are you come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. And the men turned their faces from thent and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? I want you to notice, and in this setting of Scripture, that the Lord had appeared to Abraham. They have spent quite some time together. It would take time to to kill the calf, to dress it, prepare it, to cook it, to make the, the, the meal together. So they spent a lot of time together while the meal was being prepared sitting and talking and sharing. I would say to you tonight that we, we need to spend more time with Jesus, fellowshipping with Jesus. What a beautiful visit it is. Here God is once again telling Abraham, I have not forgotten you, nor the promise that I made unto you and Sarah. I say to you tonight that every one of us need to hear that. God has not forgotten us, nor the promises that he has made to us. What God has said, he will do. He will bring it to pass just as he has spoken it. He has not forgotten it. Yea, though many years have passed from the time that he spoke what he said to us, he has not forgotten it. And in the appointed time, God will bring it to pass just as he said. This is what we need to hear over and over. We need to remind ourselves when we're going through trials, when we're going through testings, when things aren't going the way we want them, we need to remind ourselves, God has not forgotten me. He has not forgot the promise he made. He said, but I will certainly return unto the according to the time of life. Remember, God never forgets his promises. So hold on. Keep trusting. Keep believing. God has not forgotten. This is the message that God gives to Abraham. Now remember that Abraham had been sitting in the very presence of God, talking with God. Verse 16 says that the men arose and looked toward Sodom 
and, and Abraham went with them. They got up and started to walk towards Sodom. Abraham got up and went with them. And again, God speaks to Abraham. I want you to note, first God said, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do? Shall I hide from Abraham? Verse 19, for I know him, for I know him. That brings a question. God said, I know him. I wonder, what did God know about Abraham? What did he know? That he was going to be the father of a great nation? Yes, God knew that. That was a promise that God made to him. That he would command his children and his household after him? Yes, God knew that also. But there was something else that God knew about Abraham. Something that he knows about every one of us. Every one of us. Okay. Perhaps it is something that Abraham did not even know about himself. God knew that here was a man that would stand in the hedge and make up the gap for the land. I ask you to think about that for a moment. I ask you to think about everything that is happening in the world today. The tragedies of the coronavirus, all those that are dying because of the virus, those that are sick in hospitals facing death, I ask you to think about all the tragedies that are happening in the world tonight, even as I speak to you. The horrible things that are happening over and over, all around the world. Not just here in the United States, but all over the world. Think about the things that are happening here in the United States. Think about all the rioting that's going on. Those marches that are turning into riots almost every weekend. Think about all the, the bloodshed that is taking place here in America today. I want you to think about all of those that have lost their jobs, that have lost their business, businesses, everything that's going on, all of the trouble. There's something that troubles me about all that's going on, but what I'm speaking to you this, about tonight. In the midst of everything that's going on, I look, I search, and I find America is not repenting. America is not repenting. You would think that with all that's happening, America would realize we have sinned horribly against God and we need to repent. We need to get down. Our leaders need to step forward and call the nation to prayer and to repentance, asking God's forgiveness for the sins that we have committed, but it isn't happening. It isn't happening. I'm sure that there are many individuals who are praying and seeking God and asking God forgiveness for their sins. But America needs to cry out to God. Okay. Now, God knew that Abraham was a man that would stand in the hedge and make up the, gra the, 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 the lap the gap for the land. He was a faithful steward. If you have read your Bible, you would know what that means. That means that everything I am, everything I have belongs to God. We do not own anything. It all belongs to God. We are simply stewards of God's property. A steward is one that manages the property of another. We are managing God's property. It doesn't belong to us. Okay. So God told Abraham all about Sodom and Gomorrah. He told them what he, God, was about to do. Okay. As the destroying angel went on toward Sodom, the Bible says that Abraham stood before the Lord. He stood before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, I ask you to think about that. What does verse 23 mean? God has not yet left. He is still standing there with Abraham. What does it mean? Abraham drew near to God. They're standing right there together. 
So what does it mean? It means that when God told Abraham what he's about to do to Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham's heart was broken. When he heard that, his heart was broken for all of the lost in Sodom and Gomorrah. He drew near to God with a holy concern. He engaged his heart to approach God. Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 21 says, I will cause him to draw near and he shall approach unto me. For who is this that engage his heart to approach unto me, saith the Lord. I remind you the word engage means to be committed, to be committed. Abraham was committed to seek God for the lost. He was not just serving God for the blessings. He was not just serving God for what he could get out of it. Abraham drew near because he loved God. And the love of God in his heart compelled him to love the lost. He was concerned. He knew that they were lost and that they would be destroyed. So he sought God for them. He knew that there was more to life than the here and the now. There is all eternity, heaven or hell. Abraham knew this. So he came in faith. The Bible says, Hebrew eleven six, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I say to you tonight, the greatest poverty in the church today is the low expectation of God. God tells us in his word who he is. He tells us what he has done and what he will do. We read in the Gospels all the miracles that Jesus performed, the power and the glory that was his. In the Old Testament, we see the power and the glory of God. And yet, we know these things. We know that the word says, God said, what I have spoken, I will do. What I have spoken, I will bring it to pass. Yet when we have needs, are we really expecting God to meet those needs? When we pray, are we praying with expectation in our heart, knowing that as I approach God with this and bear my heart for, before him, God will hear and God will answer. I share with you tonight, God has given us the privilege of prayer. Prayer is supposed to be answered. That's God's intent. It will be answered. But we must believe. We must believe. We must believe that God will hear and that God will speak with us. In one way or another, God will do it. Okay. Abraham knew God. He knew that he was just. He was a just and righteous and fair God. Abraham knew that he would not destroy the righteous with the wicked. No, Abraham said, that be far from you to do. He had faith to believe. If I seek, God will answer. He came, the third thing I want you to see, he came in humility. Hear him. Abraham said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, who am but dust and ashes. Remember, Jesus tells us in Luke's Gospel, chapter 18, about the prayer of the publican and the sinner. Jesus said there was a publican and a sinner in the same room. The publican stood and began his prayer. He said, I thank thee that I am not like this sinner. But I fast twice a week. I pray, I tithe. Begin on to announce other things that he did, patting himself on the back. Okay. But the sinner prayed with his knees on the ground, with his head bowed low, and he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Be merciful to me, a sinner. I ask you tonight, whose prayer do you suppose God answered? Remember, God is a holy, righteous God. 
And we must approach him humbly in faith. In faith. The success of prayer. God consented to sp spare the wicked for the sake of the righteous. See what a great blessing righteous people have in any place. If we're living that righteous, holy life, no matter where we are, we are going to have an effect on all of those around us. All of those around us. Whether we realize it or not, people are watching us. If we're professing to be Christians, people are watching us. And if we're really living the life, what an imp impact we're going to have on them. What an impact. Such is the power of a prayer. I want you to note that in this prayer, God did not stop granting until Abraham stopped asking. Such is the power, the prayers of a righteous person. God hears us and God will answer. Oh, that we are walking with God if we would just truly draw near to him. Truly draw near to him. Forget about everything else that's going on. I remind you, God has told us in his word that which he is about to do. You say, what are you talking about, Pastor? Jesus is soon coming. Jesus told us in John's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. He said, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. Church, Jesus is coming again for the church. Do you remember Isaiah? The book of Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah had a vision. Isaiah said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He went into the temple and he said, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne. His train filled the temple. There in his presence, Isaiah saw himself as God saw him. And he cried out, woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell amongst a people of unclean lips. The Bible says an angel went and took a coal off of the fire, came back and touched Isaiah's lips and said, your sins are forgiven you. And God began to speak. He began to talk about those that are, that are lost. And the, he, then he asked the question, who shall go? Who shall I send for me? And Isaiah cried out, here am I, Lord, send me. Here am I, send me. That should be the cry of every one of our hearts. We realize today that Jesus is soon coming and there are multitudes around us that are lost, that are they're going to hell. The tragedy is this. Some of them may be our own, some of our own family members. Are we living the life in front of them? Are we living like Jesus? Are we truly living the life? I have said many times, and I've said it to this congregation, the desire of my heart, if the Lord takes me before the rapture, I want my wife to be able to say, my husband was a man of God. I want my daughter to be able to say, my dad was a man of God. My grandchildren, I want them to be able to say the same thing. Grandpa was a man of God. Are we living that life among our family? Do they really see the love of God in us? It makes a big difference, folks. I will remind you again tonight. God has told us what he's going to do. He's about to come. Jesus is about to come. I ask you, I want to remind you, God is looking for intercessors today men and women and young people that will draw near to God and pray. What will the result be? What will the result be? God has promised us. Second Chronicles chapter 2, 
2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Will heal their land. Folks, it is time. It is time that the church begin to seek God with all of our heart. It's time that we truly begin to live the life of a true Christian. That others, and I want to remind you tonight, that the only Jesus that many people are going to see because they will not come to church, the only Jesus they're going to see is the Jesus that they see in you. The Jesus they see in you. What do others see in us? What do they see? Church, we need to be intercessors. We need to be crying out to God for the lost around and about us. As we begin to be like Abraham, open up our heart before God and begin to intercede, God will use us to be soul winners, one way or another, to lead them to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Just recently, I read a true story. When President Eisenhower was elected to be president, he was very popular. And there was a young boy, six years old, and lived in Colorado. And he loved President Eisenhower. He wanted to meet him. President Eisenhower was his hero. And one time, President Eisenhower was visiting Colorado. And he was told about this boy. So he had his aide to find out where the boy lived, to find out about him, find out where he lived. He was dying of cancer. On a Sunday morning, he called his driver and told him, take me to this place. Totally unannounced. President walked up to the porch. He knocked on the door. The boy's father came to the door. He was amazed when he saw President Eisenhower standing there. And he was totally ashamed. He came to the door in an old, dirty pair of Levi's. He had an old, dirty shirt on. His hair wasn't even combed. He was so embarrassed. The president told him, I come to see your son. The father took him into the room where the boy was. The president spent some time with him, shook his hand and talked with him. And then he said, would you like to see my limousine? He took him out to the limousine and put him in it and took him a ride all around town in the limousine. After the president left, the town was so excited. They were talking one to another. They couldn't believe that the president of the United States come to our town to visit one of our own. Everyone was excited except the boy's father. He was embarrassed and ashamed that he appeared before the President of the United States dressed like that. I listened to that and, you know, in a way we could understand the man. It's Sunday, it's his day off, so he's just lounging around. He, he, he could have an excuse, but you hear me tonight. We are without excuse. Jesus has told us he's coming back for us. He told us to watch and be ready. To watch and be ready. I ask you tonight, are you ready? If Jesus were to come tonight, would you be ready? Would you be ready? Would you be caught up to be forever with him in the air? Bow your head with me, please. Father, tonight I thank and praise you for the privilege of preaching your gospel. I acknowledge again that in myself I cannot change. I cannot change a heart. Father, I can prepare, I can pray, I can try to preach, but I cannot change a heart. Only you can change a heart. If there are those tonight listening that are not ready to meet you, Father, they haven't prepared. 
I'm asking, may the Holy Spirit draw them unto you tonight. May this be the night that they cry out, Jesus, forgive me. I want to receive you as my Savior. I ask that they would just pray a simple prayer, asking you to forgive them their sins and come into their heart. Touch hearts and lives, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I want to thank you for being with us tonight. And I want to invite you to our service Sunday morning at 11 a.m. We will be live streaming the service. God bless you. Good